advised by all the women in my life. Not Hello and jokes. welcome back to uh, this second session um, in which we're going to discuss gender, the economy and Brexit. My name is Gemma Tetlow, I'm Chief Economist at the Institute for Government and I'm delighted to chair this very capable panel who I think from the things they've said in the past probably have quite diverse views on this topic so we should be in for a, a good debate. Um, so on the far left we have Marianne Stevenson who is the Director of the Women's Budget Group uh, Mary Ann's been working on women's equality and human rights for over 20 years and published a report earlier this year on exactly this topic of, of gender and Brexit. On my immediate right is Julian Jessup, who leads the Brexit unit at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Um, he is in the small uh, but select group of economists who are of the view that uh, Brexit will be good for the UK economy. Um, so. Uh, we'll be interested to hear his views on how that is going to feed through to a benefit for women. Um, and on my left is uh, Faisal Shaheen, who is director of the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. Um, and uh, recently uh, is put herself in the ring to take on Ian Duncan Smith in Chingford and Wood Green seat at the next election. Um, uh, so Faisal and Klaas um, uh, look at... Uh, economic inequalities, um, and she's also a, a sort of prominent activist and writer on this subject. So we're going to have seven to eight minutes of um, comments from each of the panellists, and we'll work in the order that uh, we're sitting here. Um, before I open up to um, the floor, I will then give each panellist the opportunity to come back on any specific points that they want to come back to from the other people's comments, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A with all of you, and we are due to wrap up at quarter past one. So, Marianne, great. please kick us off. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be at this event. I've been at quite a few discussions around the topic of gender and Brexit, um, and uh, this is the most mixed event I've seen in terms of both women and men in attendance. It's mainly been women's organisations who've been having these discussions. Um, I wanted to start really by picking up on some of the comments that were made um, uh, by one of the speakers on the last panel about that, that thinking about gender when we're thinking about Brexit is a distraction from discussions about the impact of different tariff levels or the impact on the economy or um, what the legal implications will be to say that my approach to thinking about gender and Brexit is exactly about that. So what, what are the gendered implications of changes in tariffs? What are the gendered implications of changes in trade agreement arrangements, both between us and the EU and between us and non-EU countries? Um, and that's seeing gender in the way Roberta described it um, in, in the earlier session as a structure. So this is a structure of expectations, of roles, of ideas about how women and men should behave and can behave that constrains, limits, directs the way women and men le live their lives, which means that women and men are differently situated in the economy, they do different types of jobs, that the vast amount of unpaid work, both care work, caring for children, caring for older people, domestic work, is carried out by women, and this affects their ability to participate fully in the labour market um, and makes them more reliant on um, public services because of their caring responsibilities, because they earn less and because they have to care for other people. And all of these things mean that any changes that happen within the UK as a result of Brexit are likely to affect women as a group differently from men as a group. So this isn't about saying um, women are kind of poor, vulnerable creatures that need a leg up and somehow we need to, you know, we should be talking about that when we're talking about Brexit. This is about saying we're going to have a major change for the UK economy, for good or ill. And there was obviously disagreement in this room about whether that's for good or ill. Whatever you think, everyone agrees there is going to be a major change. It's going to have a big impact on the UK economy. And we know from all the examples around the world that those sorts of changes to trading arrangements have a gendered impact. They affect men and women differently because men and women are differently situated in the economy. Um, and I'm going to talk about three areas. I'm going to talk about employment, I'm going to talk about um, consumers, and I'm going to talk about public services. So first of all, employment. Women work in different sectors of the economy. 
Um, and we know that Brexit, I mean, one of the big things is, of course, we still don't know what Brexit is actually going to mean. So it's very difficult to model exactly what the impact's going to be because, you know, we've got the Chequers deal now on the table. We don't know how, whether that will be accepted within, um, the, within Parliament. We don't know whether the EU will accept it. We don't know where that will go, but at least there's something on the table. Um, but we do know that sectors that are uh, very heavily integrated with the EU because they export to the EU or they rely on the EU for their inputs for the raw materials or the goods that they process or sell um, are going to be affected by changes to trading arrangements. Um, and we know that there will be winners and losers from that. So we know that some sectors may, may expand. It may be that if there's higher tariffs for certain goods coming into the UK, then domestic producers might be able to, to sell more. Um, those who are able to take advantage of, the, of those opportunities will be the people who are more mobile and have more capital because they will be the people who are able to change what they're doing, move to other parts of the country, start, start working in new sectors or providing new services. Um, and we know that women are less mobile as a group. We know that women tend to work in a smaller geographical area because their caring responsibilities tie them closer to home in terms of how far they can travel for work. We also know that women are far less likely to want to uproot their children um, in order to take jobs elsewhere, and they are more dependent on being close to older family members. They're looking after them, and those older members may be providing childcare for them. And we also know that women have lower levels of savings and investments. So if there's new business opportunities, they're less likely to be able to take advantage of that. Um, we also know that the, the Chequers deal, which is on the table at the moment, um, talks about uh, a free market for goods, but doesn't really, there's not a huge amount of detail there about what's going to happen to services. And women predominate in the service sector. So if we have a deal which hits the service sector harder, it is likely to hit women harder. And we also know that some sectors, uh, like the NHS, for example, are very dependent on the EU, both for labour, but also for inputs for pharmaceuticals and other products that are used. And therefore, if they're facing either an exodus of EU workers or an increase in costs, that will affect the women working in those sectors and the women reliant on the health care that they provide. Um, there's also the issue of employment rights. Now, there was a discussion on the panel earlier about you know, whether the the uh, rights that women have um, come from domestic law or come from EU law. They are written into domestic law, but they are underpinned by EU law. Now, that has been transferred into UK law, but it, it is much more vulnerable now for a future government, particularly if we go into a recession as a result of Brexit, to say, do you know what these rights, these maternity rights, these part-time workers' rights are luxuries that we can no longer afford and therefore we need to cut back on them. And we know for some people who are most strongly of the, the hard Brexit persuasion, that would be an opportunity that they would be very pleased to take up because they actually also want to get rid of a lot of those rights. So that's employment. Secondly, on consumer rights. And this is a gendered issue, again, because women tend to be the main managers of household budgets, particularly in poorer families. Um, there was some research a few years ago about how families managed their um, financial decision making and what it found was in richer families where you're talking about decisions about shares and investments, it tends to be the men who are in charge of financial management. In poorer families where you're talking about do we pay the gas bill or do we buy the kids new school shoes, it's the women who are in charge of managing that. As the women's budget group research has shown, women are the shock absorbers of poverty. So if there is somebody who is going to go without to make sure the kids have food on the table, it's largely going to be their mothers who are skipping meals. So if we're seeing a situation where the value of the pound falls and the cost of food imports from the EU goes up, we're going to see a squeeze on household budget and it's women who are going to be managing those household budgets and having to make those tough decisions. And finally, on public services. We know, with a few exceptions, including um, sat next to me, the vast majority of economists believe that Brexit is going to have a negative impact on the UK economy. Um, we know what happened after the last financial crisis 
shock the UK economy faced, the financial crisis of 2008, um, the government chose to enact a whole series of austerity measures. We know that those measures affected women far more severely than they affected men. We've done work at the Women's Budget Group that shows that poorer people were hit harder than richer people. Within every income group, women were hit harder than men. And within that, black and minority ethnic women were hit hardest of all. So it's the poorest black and minority ethnic women who have who've paid the highest price for austerity. Um, and if a government faced with another financial crisis decided to make similar decisions, then it would be women who are hit hardest yet again. And I say if because I think the important thing to stress is austerity is a political choice. It is not an economic necessity. Uh, it wasn't a necessity last time. It won't be a necessity again. But it's a political choice that is likely to be made. And we have to be aware of that. Um, the other issue for public, so that's about funding of public services. But the other issue for public services is actually around our trade deals with non-EU countries. And this is something that we need to think about as well as our, our deal with the EU. If we get a bad trade deal with the EU in particular, we are going to be very, we're going to be in a poor negotiating position with other countries. We are going to be desperate to do deals with them. We're going to have less to offer than we did as part of the EU because we're a smaller market. Um, and so we're going to be much more vulnerable to demands to, for example, open up our public services to um, foreign businesses to, to bid to provide those, those contracts. Um, and we know that, for example, the, um, the US is very keen for its companies to have access to the NHS to bid to provide NHS services. And that raises questions for the, the quality of care and the impact that that will have on those services. But there's also longer term impact about the rules around investment. So one of the one of the key messages from the Leave campaign was this was about taking back control, taking back control of our borders, taking back control of our laws. All trade deals involve signing up to something where you're giving away a bit of control. You're agreeing to a set of provisions in this trade agreement, and you're saying you will be bound by those provisions. Otherwise, people won't trust you to make those deals. And they all have mechanisms to deal with disputes when there's, uh, when there's an argument between two countries or between a business in one country and another state over what that trade deal obliges them to do. And all of them have some sort of way of resolving that. Within the EU, we have the European Court of Justice. Outside of the EU, you have these investor dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, and if you look at how those work and you look at some of the decisions they made, they tend to be dominated by trade lawyers who don't necessarily think about human rights, they don't necessarily think about labour standards, they don't necessarily think about the other obligations on states. And we could end up in a position um, where, for example, a, uh, a foreign company sued the UK government for putting up the national minimum wage because it had damaged their profitability. Now, all that depends on what sort of deals we sign, but we need to be aware of these things. We need to be scrutinising those deals very, very closely. If you look at the trade bill going through Parliament at the moment, um, it would give the government the power to amend all sorts of, legis all sorts of primary legislation um, if it was necessary in order to make a trade deal. We need to keep a close eye on that. So what I think we need to be calling for is a... Um, First of all, more women around the table so that these issues are actually considered. Proper equality impact assessments of all the different trade options that people are looking at um, to ensure that we actually look at who wins, who loses, and when what mitigating action are you going to take. Those people who believe that Brexit is going to be a good deal have got to accept that there will be some losers. How do you ensure that the losers are protected? How do you redistribute the gains of whatever happens from the winners to the losers in a fair way? Um, but the other thing we need to do is to be preparing for the economic shock that Brexit is going to cause. And that means the government should be investing now um, in infrastructure, both the physical infrastructure of roads, rail, new housing, but also, as Sophie said um, on the last panel, social infrastructure. We need to be looking at health, care, education. These things are not just vital for the people who receive the services, they're fundamental for the well-being of the economy. Um, and as the Women's Budget Group research has shown, investing in social infrastructure create twice as many jobs as investing in physical infrastructure. So if you're looking for something to boost the economy in advance of the shock that Brexit is likely to cause, then I would suggest investing in social infrastructure is the way forward. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Um, I think I'm here as the, the devil's advocate to, to challenge some of those arguments. And I thought I'd start there with a, a point of agreement that if Brexit is done badly, and in particular, if there's a sort of chaotic no deal Brexit that some of us feel we might be heading towards, then um, almost everybody will be worse off. And that applies to, to women and men. It applies to single people, it applies to families, it applies to northerners, it applies to southerners, it applies to Arsenal supporters, to Tottenham supporters. I think in that sort of you know, worst case scenario, the, the gender impact issue is probably secondary to the wider macroeconomic impact. But I very much take a lot of what, what Mary was saying about how women might still be worse off even in a, in a more benign scenario. Um, most of what we have heard today that does seem to be based on the assumption that Brexit will be very bad for the economy in, in, in all scenarios. And that, that is just what I want to, to challenge in, in two ways. Um, first of all, I accept, as we all know, that the consensus of mainstream economics is that Brexit will make us, us worse off. Um, but there's a wide range of estimates for how negative that impact would be. And there's even some estimates suggesting that it will be positive. Now, I'm not going to go full Minford here and say that the economy is going to be 7% bigger, but I think it's important to recognise the uncertainty around those, those estimates. There are scenarios where the UK would be better off. Um, the second point, though, it's really important when we're talking about a rerun, potentially, of the austerity that followed the 2008 recession. It's important to put all these numbers in context. So let, let's assume the consensus is right and that the economy is, say, 5% smaller than it would otherwise have been over a 15-year period. I think the crucial thing to appreciate is that's relative to a baseline where the economy might be growing by, say, 1.5% per year, which compounds up to, say, 25% growth. Or if it's growing at one and three quarter points per year, that's 30% growth. So even if you knock 5% off, you're still looking at a situation where the economy is between 10, so it's between 20 and 25% bigger than it would otherwise have been. So that's not a recession scenario. And I, th I think it's misleading to, to go back to 2008 and the austerity that followed that as a model to, um, that will be repeated. Um, in terms of the specific impacts, though, on, on women, I, I similarly have, have broken it down. I've, I'm going to go for fiscal, trade, NHS, and workplace rights. Um, as far as the fiscal hit is concerned, I mean, the, there's clearly an assumption that there will be a downturn in GDP that prompts cuts in, in government spending. Um, to me, this does sound rather like the, the George Osborne warning before the referendum, that there was going to be a punishment budget if we voted to leave, um, which in the event, of course, proved wrong. Um, quite rightly, the government recognised that you know, in an economic downturn, what you actually need to do is loosen fiscal policy. Monetary policy was loosened as well. And I think if the scenario we're talking about is a long period of, of somewhat slower growth than it would otherwise have been, then I think in that scenario, the government might be quite willing to actually run a slightly bigger deficit than it would otherwise have done, rather than leap to the sort of austerity that did in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, but let's assume that the government does try and find savings or, or, or raise more revenue. Will that necessarily hit women more? Now, I'm well aware of the analysis the, that was done in the, in, over the last few years, suggesting that I think 86% of the changes to tax and welfare benefits uh, was borne by, by women. Um, as it happens, I've got a few problems with that analysis. It's one of those things that is you know, factually correct but potentially misleading. Um, a good example there is the withdrawal of child benefit from uh, relatively well-off families, which is something I think actually most economists supported. Now, it is technically correct that women are typically the people who receive the child benefit. So in that sense, women are people who bear that cost. Uh, but it seems odd to assume that the whole family doesn't lose money, including, including the father. Um, another example is the raising of the retirement age for, for women, which obviously by definition hits women, not men. Again, that's something that many economists would have supported uh, as something necessary to deal with the ageing population. So I'm, I'm wary of that. Um, but finally, let's assume that this, this sort of gender analysis is meaningful. How would the government respond? How would it, for example, raise more revenue? Now, I suspect that another government... Um, might actually do so by raising the levels of income tax paid by higher earners, um, by increasing taxes on wealth, and by reversing some of the cuts in corporation tax that were planned by the Conservative government. In that scenario, actually, it will be men who are bearing more of the burden. So I just wanted to challenge the assumption it's necessarily women that will bear the burden of, of tax, and tax changes and so on. Um, the next area is, is trade, and there's, there's lots of different threads here. Um, one is the idea that food prices would inevitably rise after, after Brexit, either because of some combination of um, 
a much weaker pound or, or increases in tariffs on our imports from the EU. Um, as far as the pound is concerned, I, I, I think you know, forecasting the impact of this sort of thing on currency markets is a mugs game. If we, if we do get through this period of uncertainty, I actually wouldn't be surprised to see the pound recover a bit. Um, a lot of bad news is already priced in. As far as tariffs is concerned, that's a very good example of something's in the control of our government. You know, we don't have to raise tariffs on imports from the EU. We could actually take the opportunity to lower tariffs on imports from the rest of the world. So the net effect of that would actually be to lower prices rather than, rather than raise them. Um, there's also discussion around sectoral analysis on um, you know, particular sectors being hit harder than others. And I think actually Mary made some particularly interesting points there about, about mobility, women being less able to move smoothly from one type of work to another. And I think those are very good points. And that's the sort of thing that the government should be addressing actually regardless of, of, of Brexit. Um, but as far as the impact on particular sectors is concerned, I mean, it is right women tend to work more in services than, for example, manufacturing. Um, that might actually be a positive here because services will be less affected by Brexit than those sectors that are more exposed to international trade. Um, we also don't know exactly what will happen to trade barriers. It may well be, we clearly, I think, we'll have increased trade barriers with Europe, but potentially lower trade barriers to the rest of the world. So the next effect on particular sectors is hard to work out. Um, but I, I would be wary of focusing on trying to replicate what we currently have. I mean, one of the, the points about opening up to more free trade and more competition is that you do tend to move from areas that might have been protected but where you don't have any great advantage to those where your comparative advantage lies in future. And it's not obvious to me that, for example, we'd want to be thinking about protecting jobs in relatively low-wage, low-value-added sectors like clothing and textile, which happen to be largely taken by women at the moment, rather than encouraging a shift towards higher-value-added jobs uh, that were where the wages will be higher too. Um, just on this also related to trade, there's the issues around immigration policy. I mean, like most economists, I, I backed the proposals of the uh, Migration Advisory Council earlier in the week. Uh, and there are some potential positives for women there that will be unleashed by Brexit. One is the possibility of a, of a cap on low-wage immigration. Um, you know, women tend to be, of course, lower paid. So to the extent that immigrant labour is competing with them, that's a potential upside. Um, there are obviously concerns about labour shortages if we allow this policy to happen. But again, that is something in the hands of the government. If the government wanted to take a more flexible approach towards uh, people coming into work in the NHS, for example, the British government would be able to do that. Um, and then finally, on, on trade deals, um, I actually share the concern about investor state dispute resolutions. In fact, many of us on the free market side don't like them. Um, earlier this week, the Institute of Economic Affairs, one of a number of think tanks that signed up to a proposal hosted by the Initiative for Free Trade and Cato, uh, pro presenting an outline for US-UK trade deal. And we explicitly said we wouldn't want an investor state dispute resolution in that because it does favor large companies. Um, that brings me on to the NHS because, of course, another aspect is the potential opening up of the NHS to, uh, to more competition if we do free trade deals with the rest of the world. I, of course, would you know, instinctively see that as a good thing. I mean, the, the American companies already provide goods and services um, to the NHS and to other forms of public sector provision. Um, and I think more competition would actually be a good thing. Um, but if you don't like that, just because the US has a certain way of doing things, doesn't mean we need to copy that into the, the UK free trade agreement. And in particular, again, the IFT Cato report explicitly said that if the UK government wanted to, it could carve out certain areas of public services and protect the NHS. And of course, the US, the US would be doing the same thing, so this is a reciprocal approach. Um, and then finally, on, on workplace rights, I, um, I spent a lot of time with, with, with Brexiteers, and uh, honestly, None of this has come up as, as an issue. Nobody has suggested that Brexit is going to be a great opportunity to, to roll back women's rights. Um, the only thing I can think about is, is areas where we might want a more flexible labour market than we currently have, or to resist changes that are heading in the opposite direction. But the, the, reason, we, the reason free marketeers suggest that is not that we don't like women. It's because we think that this is actually a better way to create jobs. If I give you a single example, zero hours contracts, um, very much the flavour of the moment. You know, many people on the left hate them. Many women actually like them. It suits, that flexible working suits women. It allows them to go back into the labour market in paid employment that wouldn't otherwise have done. Um, finally, whatever you think about these sort of things, remember that this is still parliamentary democracy. If, if a mad right-wing government, you know, headed by a rampant Anglo-Catholic with a double-barreled name, wanted to try and roll back all of these women's rights, and I, I tell you, I've spoken to him, 
never come up with this idea, but even if he did, he's got to get that through Parliament, and ultimately he's electable, he's responsible to the British public in a general election. So um, I think this is an area where there's a danger of being paranoid. That you know, Brexit, there isn't a hidden agenda there to, to roll back or attack women's rights. Brexit still has to be done well, and I absolutely accept that you know, women could well be casualties if it's done badly, but it doesn't have to be so. Um, fact, sorry, just to end on a positive note, this is why I actually think this conference is a good idea. Um, I do think it is helpful to think about the impacts of Brexit on particular groups in society, uh, whether that's women or northerners or, or whoever else it might be. We do need to have these discussions, but I think a lot of the concerns are, are overdone. Um, well, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Julian. Pfizer, please finish us off. Great, OK. Um, so Britain has an inequality problem. And I want to make that statement straight from the, the start. I think we have to understand gender issues alongside race, alongside region, alongside class, alongside income and wealth inequalities, because it's only when you really understand that fuller, fuller picture of inequality, you understand that overlap, and you understand really the, the huge task in front of us. Um, on gender, we know that women are disproportionately in low paid work, uh, that they've been disproportionately hit by austerity, that there's a pay gap. On race, we know that if you have an African or Muslim sounding name, you'll have to send as many, three times as many CVs to get an interview. On class, um, this is often something forgotten, and um, we know that in people with the same job, if you're from a more working class background, uh, that average pay difference is around 6K. There's a great study done by Sam Friedman at the LSE. Have a look at it. On regions, we have the largest spatial inequalities of the whole of Europe. Um, I should have really brought the graph. It's, the graph. It's, it's quite dramatic. In terms of GDP, we need more than seven Liverpools to get one city of, of London. Um, and within those regions as well, so within London, we know there's huge inequalities. So Kensington and Chel uh, um, Chelsea, twice as likely to have... Um, poor A-levels, uh, oh, high A-levels, three A-levels than those embarking in Dagenham. And so there's these huge inequalities across the country in various different ways. And wealth and income, um, we know that there's been a growth in the number of people going to food banks. We know that there's, a, there's been a tripling of homelessness, and that's not often ca captured in the income data. But we can see that. We know that the bottom has fallen out of, the, of, of um, our welfare net. And at the same time, we know we can look at the rich list every year and see that their wealth is going up uh, very, very quickly. Um, I think it's really important to, to understand those things and, and understand what Brexit does to that. Now, for me, we, I run a think tank called Class. When we were looking at the Brexit question, we looked specifically at whether the EU had delivered for the working class. And it was, you know, it was mixed in multiple ways. Um, we didn't take a position either or. Um, we just took a position on looking at the impacts in terms of inequality. Now, looking forward and looking at the policies and looking at who is driving forward Brexit, I truly believe that inequality will grow. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of economic, um, economic studies that show that. But there's three reasons. One is there's no objective to lower inequality. There's no aim to address inequality in any kind of Brexit deal. So we've heard lots about, in the beginning of Theresa May coming out and saying burning injustices, where's all that gone? When you look at what's happening with Brexit deals and considerations, really the only consideration is that we don't have a hard Brexit, uh, we, or we don't have a no-deal Brexit even. And so inequality has been completely lost in that conversation. You look at the white papers, do a control F, look for inequality, look for regional problems, look for... It's barely there at all, if there. And that tells you a lot. Inequality, addressing inequality isn't something that you can think about as an afterthought. It's a structural problem. It's built into our economy. So when we're designing a new economy in the post-Brexit world, if you're not thinking about inequality, then it's just going to get worse. So it may be benign. It may be that they don't want it to increase. But they're not actually including it in their formula going forward. Um, and, and that's a huge worry for me. If you look at austerity, for instance, they did talk about the broadest shoulders, et cetera. So at least there, you, you, know, you heard some of that. And they even did do some of the distributional impact assessments when they were doing the budgets. Like, I've been looking at inequality for a long time. So looking at the first of Osborne's budgets in Annex D or whatever, they had like a distributional impact of the budget. You found that it was regressive. Their own graphs told you that. But they weren't taking it into account. 
Um, I had a friend that worked in that treasury team at the time, and I remember asking him, oh, what does it show? And, he, and asked him how it was done, and he said, oh, we do that right at the last minute. It's not involved in the decision making. So when, it wasn't, when they did it, they actually actively did do it, to be fair, even if they hid it in Annex D and didn't pay attention. And it's st we still had a regressive austerity program. Can you imagine what's going to happen when it's not included at all? I think second is definitely around the points that have been raised about what the deal looks like um, and the vision. And I think what is clear, and we heard a bit about that just now from Julian, um, a kind of hard Brexit view of what Brexit look like, looks like and how it works is very much a kind of tax havens, more privatization, um, a lot of the kind of trickle down type theory that we've, we've had in recent decades. Um, and that on its own is worrying. And, and whilst I get, I totally think it's true that a lot of the forecasts and the way that Osborne spoke about Brexit back during the referendum was unhelpful. Um, I think you have to look at the values and vision of the people in charge of this process in terms of what deal we're going to get. Um, so the deal and vision is, is really important for what it means for inequality. We don't know exactly what that is yet, but yeah, I mean, I think... A hard Brexit world is, is more of a tax haven type situation. Um, and there's certainly, I think we need to talk, think more about the short term hit of a recession or at least some kind of slowdown. And in that case, we do need to think about a big public investment program. Now, whilst I was really happy that Julian pointed out that, yeah, government could run more of a deficit, that's not, that's not the sounds or narrative we've heard for the last eight years. So that will be really interesting how that's turned. We've told the public that any kind of debt is wrong, um, and that's gone into people's heads. I hear that said to me all the time. I mean, only five countries, five or six countries in the world have no debt, right? I mean, it, it's like unbelievable how much that lie has taken hold. Um, so it'll be interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure, and I was happy to hear Julian say it, but I'm not, I'm not sure that they will run more of a fiscal deficit and they will do the investment program, but that's certainly what is needed. And finally, I think there's... I've just spent the whole, the whole morning with some, some parents in Chinkford who are, whose school has been um, really messed up because of academization. I think the other reason why I think inequality will grow and has grown in this interim period is because we've just taken our eye off the ball. We're not paying attention to lots of issues of housing, of schools, and of what's happening in the NHS. Um, because not only is the conversation in our political sphere often about Brexit, and the political shenanigans surrounding that, not about the, the real substance of what's happening, but rather the political drama. Um, civil servants are also spending a lot of time thinking about Brexit. Of course, I mean, of course they are, right? It's not as if we've massively expanded our civil service to deal with Brexit alongside all of these other issues. It's just not happened. Um, so we are, we are ignoring issues that are driving inequality that are making it more difficult for working class people and people on low incomes and in deprived areas to get on in life. Um, and I, and I, you know, I think those things, as time's going on and we're just continually going around in circles and just the uncertainty, the more that's becoming evident. Like I had a parent today who said to me, she voted Brexit, she said to me, um, why aren't we getting any help on this? There's academies across the country that are in trouble and our schools have been ripped off and why isn't anyone paying attention to this? And I think it's a really, and I, and I genuinely think it's because there's too many people wrapped up in thinking about Brexit right now. Um, and we've been thinking about it for two and a half years, and we'll probably be thinking about it still for another two and, two and a half years or, or more. And so, you know, we're just really missing the ball on all of the other issues. So, yeah, so we haven't been, so we're not, we haven't got an objective to tackle inequality in Brexit right now. We're not speaking about it. The possible trade deals um, on the table or the possible deals on the table look bad for inequality. Um, and finally, because we've been caught up in this argument, and let's face it, a lot of it has been going around in circles. I feel like we could have come to some sort of decision some time ago, especially as so many people that wanted Brexit have wanted it for decades. And, you know, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Ian Duncan Smith and where was their plan? So we've, we've not paid attention to all the underlying issues in society. I might leave it there, but I mean, just to say, I think Brexit could have been done differently, um, and I, I'm not someone that thinks the EU is perfect. Um, but the track we are on right now 
I just don't see any other way apart from that it, that inequality will get worse. Thanks. Marianne, is there anything you would like to come back on? Just um, a couple of things. I mean, you know, it's it's great to hear that um, a, a future government might actually decide to um, deal with uh, the economic sh shock of Brexit by um, raising income taxes and corporation taxes and wealth taxes. Um, I don't see any evidence that that's, that's the, the route that they would choose to go down. But obviously, you know, it's good to hear recognition that these are choices, that we face choices. And I, I think it is really important, actually, to point out, you know, it's very easy to talk as though there was inevitable path. So this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And it's not inevitable. At every point along the way, there are choices and decisions and things can go in different directions. I suppose what I'm trying to do is, based on what we know about how, peop how those in power have behaved in other similar situations, what do we think is likely to happen? I mean, similarly, with this question of um, undermining um, women's rights in the workplace and equality rights, I mean, I don't think that there is a gaggle of Brexiteers sat in the corner rubbing their hands going, oh, what evil thing can we do to women today? I don't, you know, that's not how I think it works at all. I don't think that there's a let's get women plot. What I think is there's a, a long-standing belief among a lot of people that a lot of these rights and protections are so much red tape, and if we could only be freed from them, the world would be a better place. And I disagree. No, it's, a, it's an agreement about that. But, and I think that it's not people saying Brexit is an opportunity to do this, but it's generally, you know, if you're any good at politics, you kind of never fail to take advantage of a good crisis. So if something happens that gives you a cover for what you want to do all anyway, you start bringing those things in. And I think that links into this idea that, you know, actually uh, workers' rights somehow hold women back or prevent women from being able to take up jobs that they might want. So, you know, we've heard that flexible working actually suits women because it enables them to get back into work. If you've ever had to manage childcare and work, you will know that you need to know when you are working because you need to book and pay for this childcare in advance. There is not a wonderful world of flexible childcare where you can get a text at 10 o'clock the night before saying you're, you're starting at 7.30 tomorrow morning. And you can go, oh yes, of course I can do that. My two small children who are over here will somehow mysteriously be cared for by somebody else. People want flexible work, but that's about that's not about flexibility from the employer that's so extreme that you do not know when you're going to work even the next day. You need to know. It doesn't help women not to know when they're working. Um, and so that, that form of flexibility in a zero hours contract is, is extremely damaging to women. The second point that I wanted to pick up on was this issue about um, cutting back on um, EU immigration and how that would, could create more opportunities for women in low-paid jobs. The issue there is that we already have, massive sh we have a massive recruitment crisis in sectors like care. You know, there isn't this problem that there's this huge influx of, of EU um, labour that's pushing wages down. Actually, it's really, really difficult to recruit. Lots and lots of organisations trying to recruit people into work with care. It's a sector that's got incredibly high turnover, incredibly difficult to retain staff. Um, it's one of those sectors where sort of classic economic rules that if you have um, uh, a shortage of, of labour supply, somehow wages will go up, don't seem to hold true. Wages are still remain resolutely low, and that's largely because local authorities that are paying for much of this care have had their budgets massively squeezed, and they are in turn pushing down on care providers who are in turn only paying people um, national living wage. And the third question, really briefly, is about... Um, loss of, of social security benefits affecting both people in households. And obviously it is not true that the only person who's affected when a, a benefit is cut is the person who's receiving it. People live in households. However, we also know income is not shared equally within households. And we also know, and there's been extensive research on this, that the person who receives that income has more control over how that money is spent. So although a loss of child benefit or cuts of child tax credits and so on and so forth will affect everybody in the household, the women who are receiving that money, who are getting less money or in some cases no money, 
have less bargaining power within the household about how households, about how about financial decision making, and in particular for women who are um, in relationships with higher rate taxpayers who are receiving child benefit, for some of them, that is the only money that they had in their own right. And you talk to women who have left violent relationships, and for very many of them, the child benefit is the only money that they had, the money that they didn't need to claim, the thing that they didn't need to sort out. So actually removing child benefit, even from um, uh, partners of higher rate taxpayers, leaves women in a vulnerable position. Um, I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions. Are there any Sorry, specific I over, I that either went. of you two want to come back I just on? want to come back on one thing. But you, do you want to do you? No, I'm happy to. Okay. Just quickly, yeah, just, it struck me actually in terms of when I talk about the opportunity cost while we're doing Brexit, that we're not looking at schools, etc. The other thing that we're not doing is that we're, or, or that we are doing, is that we can continue to blame all our problems on the EU. We can continue to pay low wages on immigrants rather than bad bosses and very little protections within the labour market. Um, and so we're not sort of moving the argument on. We're just kind of, we, we're going to end up dealing with what we think are the, the drivers and finding actually they weren't the drivers at all. And I think it's really important for us in these discussions to, to push back on some of the myths around the ways in which the EU has been bad for the UK. We've kind of got to continue to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now we've got about 25 minutes for questions from all of you. I'm not sure I've chaired a panel before where people gasped in the audience during the opening <laughs> remarks, so um, I imagine it's going to be fairly lively. When you ask your question, could you please say your name and where you're from? Um, I'll probably, uh, if there are lots of hands go up, I'll try and collect two or three questions together and then get panellists to respond. Thank you. So there's definitely one down here. Um, I have a business question. There, sorry, I think it's a microphone just behind you. Um, I have many questions, but the question I want to raise is this. Like many women, um, I have a very small business that sells services. Half of my services, about half of my services, I sell into the UK, uh, and the other half I, uh, I uh, sell into the EU. So six months out from Brexit, I have no idea what the conditions are going to be for selling my services into the EU. Each service can be a very... Each item can be of very low value, like 30, 50 pounds or something. If I have to pay something on that, I can have to close my business. And as you can probably hear from my accent, I am an EU citizen. So uh, hearing someone say, someone who's in government say, oh, it will be good because we will be able to restrict um, uh, EU citizens here so that British people can get jobs. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to my company if it goes badly. I will probably be one of those EU citizens. Great. Help. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I think there's a hand further back as well. Yes, the lady in the middle. Uh, good morning. I am Montserrat Mir, uh, Confederal Secretary at the European Trade Union Confederation, responsible for gender equality, that's the way to be here today, and also for energy and climate change. I want to ask to the different speakers, because I think that all of them can have a, a different answer. Do, do you think that uh, uh, women in the United Kingdom are, are aware of what is at risk, what is at stake, when definitively UK will be out, no? I'm telling that because with the TUC, with the, our colleagues, that they will continue being affiliated, they will continue fighting for the same uh, objectives and aims, even if they are not part of the EU. I want to, to thank the solidarity especially on the negotiations that now we are taking with the Parliament, with the Council, with the Commission, on World Life Balance Directive. And, and my question is, do you think that clear uh, link with the previous panel that citizens, especially women, are aware, are concerned, what is at risk? Because we are trying to have a fantastic, on our opinion, a good and new World Life Balance Directive with these flexible working arrangements, new parental leave, breaking stereotypes, and uh, th there is an umbrella that can benefit a lot of women in Europe and in UK. And at the same time, talking about employment, the revision of the predictable working conditions, do you know that if we achieve, we will have the possibility to have your working conditions before to begin to work. Even if it's a work of five weeks, or one week, or one day, you will have before to begin to work this 
working conditions in your hands with more freedom to say yes or no, and at the same time the access to social protection that is another part of this, uh, this, this uh, social pillar. And my question is addressed to all. Is a lot that is at risk and, and is a lot for to, to have this, this uh, discussion and this debate and I'm, I'm happy to be there no? because I'm listening to different voices but at the end I'm not sure if all the people that is here is, is aware of what is at risk, what is at stake, no, not only to be in or to be out because a lot, uh, Gibraltar, Ireland, a lot of things that we at the beginning we don't consider but they are important for people and people is behind all that, no? I want to ask to all, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, should we take those two questions um, first? Um, does anyone want to kick off? Shall I? I kick mm -hmm. off. Um, you referred to a government representative. I hope you didn't think that was me, by the way. Um, we're very much a, an independent free market economics think tank, but um, I'm happy to, to partly address that point. Um, first of all, as, as far as um, citizens' rights are concerned before Brexit, I think that the government should unilaterally, if it's not already done so, guarantee those, those rights. I know that's part of the uh, discussions around the withdrawal agreement, but I think that's one good example where the government should do the right thing unilaterally, regardless of whether or not the, the EU reciprocates. So I would hope that that would reassure people already here. And then after Brexit, I think the proposals of the Migration Advisory Council are very, very sensible ones. That's, that's the sort of proposal that I would want. Um, if anything, actually, I, I'm a free marketeer, so I'm actually in favour of, of migration. Many Brexiteers are, which is sometimes a, an image that doesn't come across properly. So um, if there are skills shortages in, in the UK, then certainly you know, bring in people, um, whether it's from the EU or from the rest of the world. I mean, th this would be, I think, an important way of addressing the valid concerns that people have about the impact on vulnerable people in, in society. Um, the second point, actually a more general point about uncertainty, um, a few months ago, we, we did have what I thought was a credible plan. And, you know, if people asked me to explain what Brexit would look like, it's quite easy. You know, it's a Canada plus, plus, plus free trade agreement with streamlined customs arrangements and mutual recognition in financial services and a, and a transition period while we sort out the details. And, um, and then suddenly that's been thrown up in the air and we're, we're with a checkers plan that you know, remarkably has united the, both the UK and the EU in opposition to it. So I can fully understand why uncertainty is, has increased. This comes back to my point about how if Brexit is done badly, and at the moment I think it is being done badly, then the short-term costs are much bigger than they, than they need to be. Um, the third point, just around sort of zero hours contracts and, and, and flexibility. I mean, it's interesting that you know, even, even the Taylor review that was quite a long way on, on the left, if you like, of analysing this, said that further regulation of zero hours contracts was, was a bad idea. And I think my answer to this is, is really need to balance rights and, and obligations. If you, if you have a zero hours contract or many of these similar forms of flexible employment, you obviously have fewer rights, but also you have fewer obligations. I mean, you don't typically have notice periods and so on. You're not committing to work a certain number of weeks or days or whatever it might be. And I basically think as far as possible, employers and employees should be free to negotiate these. There are clearly some examples where employers behave badly, the, you know, the bad bosses, the evil bosses, but um, I think there's a danger of using those few hard cases to come up with a blanket ban. We know that when people have been offered the choice of remaining on the zero hours contracts that they have, overwhelmingly they've chosen to do so, which I think is telling you something. So you may well want to make sure that people have the right to have more protections than they do currently do, but if you insist on that, there is a danger that employers back away from those contracts whatsoever. So some people might get a better contract other people can't get those forms of employment at all. And it's about getting that trade-off right. And I really think it's the government that's best to make that decision. Pfizer or Varane, do you want to come back on either of the two questions that were asked? Yeah, just on the, I guess, more broadly thinking about the immigration stuff. And let's face it, obviously, that was a massive part of the vote. Um, and, you know, we've made a mistake, even with the, the migration, uh, migration Advisory Committee report. We always do this thing, and when I was starting off my career... I was working with someone that was doing this type, these types of reports as well, just saying, you know, if migrants actually um, pay in way more taxes than they take out. But I think, you know, the problem with that argument is that it, it's a very economic argument, and actually we should be making a broader emotional argument, an argument about the type of society we are. 
Um, and also, and it does also demand us being honest about the history of this country, of both mm. emigration, which we always forget, and immigration, about why it is that people that look like me are here because of the empire. It does open up a broader discussion um, on, on immigration and this country in a very different type of narrative. And we're just not, even on the left sometimes, and we might have that privately, but we're not hearing that still come, come through. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, when they say, oh, we need less immigration, and you say to them, yeah, but for every pound that they put in, there's a... That doesn't go in, they just get annoyed about that. Um, and so, you know, the conversations about who's your doctor and who's your friends and who are you actually fighting with, you know, I think one of the most pernicious things that has been done is, the, is just talking about the white working class as a separate group to the working class in general, which is multi-ethnic. They are facing a lot of the same problems from bad bosses, from weak labour market institutions from zero hour contracts. And I have to say that actually, there's a lot of research that shows that overwhelmingly when you ask, a lot of people don't know they're on zero hour contracts. And the reason for that is because their companies are giving them work every week. They could put them on a contract that said 16 hours or 21 hours or whatever, but they just choose not to so they can withdraw it at the last minute. So they didn't, often don't even know they're on zero hour contracts. And, and actually a lot of them don't want to be on zero hour contracts. Some of them do. But not overwhelmingly, I, you know, I think it's important to come back on that myth. So I think, you know, this whole thing demands a broader conversation about immigration. And we, and we have to admit we've made mistakes on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think a lot of things weren't considered um, definitely on, say, the Northern Ireland border. I find it weird that we didn't have that conversation before. Mm. But saying that, I don't think we should act as if people didn't know what they were voting for as well. I think sometimes people did know there would be an economic hardship. So actually, there's some surveys to show that people said, no, we are willing to lose money. Now, how much that might be is a, is a different conversation. So I think, um, you know, you have to be careful. Some people have really, have really bought into the narrative that it's the EU's fault, that if we're not part of the EU anymore, then we will get like, loads more control and that will make people's lives easier. Um, and on the other side, there's some people that go, well, it can't be much worse. And mm -hmm. so, you know, they did, they did hear that it could have an impact, but they just got A, annoyed by the people that were saying, saying that, who they see as an elite, an elite group. Um, and B, they were like, well, so what? It's not like life's that great here anyway. Great. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, Marianne. <laughs> um, I, I, I agree very much that EU citizens should not be used as, as bargaining chips. Um, and I think, um, uh, I think, you know, as somebody who works with EU citizens, as somebody who has family members who live in the EU, I think we, you know, need to resolve that as, as soon as possible. In terms of the uncertainty, and we're already seeing the impact of Brexit in terms of uncertainty. We're seeing that in terms of companies choosing not to invest. We're seeing that in companies choosing to set up overseas rather than in the UK or move production overseas because, you know, it's not very long to go. Now, obviously, if we get a deal, then there's a transition period and it's all fine. If we don't, if we crash out on WTO terms, then that's actually very, very soon and people do need to prepare for that. Um, because although, I mean, I, I've kind of avoided for a long time talking about a no-deal scenario because I thought it was scaremongering, but actually I am beginning to get a bit anxious. We have, there's lots of different groups of people all playing chicken with each other and seeing who's going to blink first, and that, that's not a good way of making policy. I also think we're kind of being set up for a myth of the Brexit that could have been if it only hadn't have been let down either by people who didn't manage it properly or by the traitors who talked Britain down or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, the reason that Brexit is so difficult to negotiate is because people were promised contradictory things during the referendum. They were promised that we could take back control of our laws and our borders, but that we would also be part of a Norway-style deal with, which actually does allow free movement. We were promised more money for the NHS, while at the same time we're going to, you know, we're going to have something that's going to have a negative impact on the economy, and we were promised... Um, you know, there were so many promises that cannot all be fulfilled. So it's going to be very, very difficult for anybody to come up with a Brexit deal that actually works in a way that meets what different groups of people thought they were voting for. And I think that's, you know, one of those problems. And there's been no point at which those in favour of Brexit have actually kind of 
fronted up to that and said, yes, some of the people who were campaigning alongside us promised things that we did not agree with and this is not going to happen. Um, I think the question about are women aware of what is at risk, I think, to be honest, I mean, I think the thing we have to acknowledge is that most of us in this room are slightly odd. Most of people in this country do not want to talk about Brexit. They have had enough of Brexit. They think it is really boring. Those of us who are slightly obsessed enough to come to a conference or even obsessed enough to write papers on it, we're a bit weird. Um, we're not usual. And, and that is true of lots of different areas of politics, to be honest. Um, and it's not about you know, ignorance or stupidity or anything else. It's that people have got a lot of things to be getting on with in their lives. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think a lot of this debate has been quite abstract and it has been using lots of acronyms that people don't understand and very, very complicated. Um, or it's been so dumbed down into just simple messages, which is where you get back to the kind of contradictory things. You can't, you can't have it all. Um, so I think those of us who care about these things and want to broaden out the debate really have to think about how we do that and how we talk about it and what sort of examples we use. And I think probably starting with the experience of, of individual people is, is probably the best way to do that. Um, so I think that's all I'm going to say on that. Great. Thank you. So, um, Right, I will take three questions this time. So we've got a lady towards the back, I think had her hand up first, and then I'll take these two here. I'll stand up because I'm very short. Uh, my name's Hilary Burridge. I'm a sociologist and adjunct professor at Northwestern University in Chicago, but I live in Britain, obviously. Um, my question is about the informal economy, the invisible economy. We, we've talked a lot about the formal economy, but actually, particularly for women, the informal economy and the invisible economies are very, very important. Um, I want to point you particularly to the really unpleasant aspects of that, human trafficking, FGM, forced marriage. And you get the idea. You know, I, FGM is my field, but I'm certainly very well aware of the other fields too. Um, there is no preparation of any sort to protect people in these informal economies. And FGM is an informal economy, just like everything else. You sell your daughter to another man to make money that you invested in by feeding her so far before she gets sold, essentially. It's not quite like that, but that is essentially what it is. There's a huge economy predicated on these things. Human trafficking is thought to be one of the, the largest economies in the world, along with drug trafficking. Um, so we've got this issue which has been totally, totally ignored. I'm not ignoring it. I hope other people will help me not to ignore it, but it has been. When we add into that my deep concern, and I've talked to one or two colleagues here who sort of say really, and I say yes, really, 70%, the most persuasive indicator of voting for leave, and we won't make a judgment, we'll just say it straight, is a predication for capital punishment. That does not tell me that the people who want to vote leave in general are in favour of human rights, but it does tell me that human rights such as trafficking, FGM, etc., are going to be rather low on the agenda. I leave it there. I'm sure colleagues will have things to say. Thank you. Great. And next, the lady on the aisle. Just part, yes. My name's Susan Lloyd. I'm a retired barrister. I'm a woman, I come from the north, and when I was young, I, the things you've been saying about equality of women could have been exactly the same. And in some ways, very little has changed. A lot has changed through the EU, where it has changed. And also, what gave me my break is to be able to work with children uh, was the Equality Act of 1975. And what I want to address is, both through the European Union legislation and our own institutions, when you talk about we, could you define who we is? I, I would like to be part of the we. I have benefited uh, through getting um, part-time, that's what we used to call zero hours, part-time, no protection really, apart from it was a government appointment, but certainly in those days, no pension and n no idea about, apart from about a week's notice, whether you'd be sitting on a, 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 a what was called then a quasi judicial body. And I just wondered how we can take this forward, this concept of we. 
so that the society realizes that women are very, very important in our society, and families are, because juggling families with zero, and I think this has been mentioned, and I've been through that, is extremely difficult. Thank you. Um, Susan Barton from the Department for International Trade. Um, and, and given that, I want to speak, ask, speak specifically about trade policy. Um, the EU has some amazing gender policies, but they were poorly implemented when it came to uh, trade policy. Mm. Um, when the UK takes back its independent trade policy, what type of um, approach do you think we should take to issues of um, inequality, regional, um, gender, um, wider um, issues with respect to our trade policy. Sh how should we um, use trade policy to achieve wider social benefits? And um, you, you've, the first two speakers spoke about um, the employment, consumption and impacts on public services. Um, what should we be doing to ensure that they work for all, if anything? Great, thank you. So I'll ask you to respond to each of those three. So the first one, just a reminder, was about the human rights impact of Brexit. The second one was on the impact on women's equality. And can I ask you to kind of focus on what Brexit does to this rather than us getting drawn into general questions about zero hours contracts? Um, and the third question about how can we use trade policy in particular to try and um, further some of these social issues. Um, Marianne, do you want to go first this time? Okay, so I mean, in answer to the first one, I think it's important to recognise the, the EU is not just an economic project, it was also, it's also a project, uh, a broader social project, and I think that you're absolutely right that some of these issues which we need to tackle cross-border because they involve, you know, like human trafficking, um, uh, require cross-border cooperation, and it's very important that as we leave the EU, we don't lose those ability, the, the ability to deal with those, those cross-border issues effectively. Um, uh, on part-time workers' rights and um, equality rights post-Brexit, well, obviously, uh, the part-time workers' rights that we have in this country are a result of um, EU law and they are now part of UK law, the fear is that they could be removed quite easily by a future government, um, but also that further improve, we will not be able to benefit from further improvements in EU law. So, I mean, I agree. I think, you know, the EU is, is never a feminist project. However, there are a lot of feminists working within the EU. It has been a, uh, a place where a lot of work has been done to try and improve um, the situation of women. And um, one of the things I feel sad about is the be losing the opportunity to be part of a, a general kind of progression. On the third quote about um, gender and trade policy, I think this is a really important question. Um, I think that trade agreements now often include um, social chapters which include a whole set of obligations around labour standards and um, you know, environmental standards and so on. And I know that there's been work at the um, European Parliament level to look at the gender impact of trade agreements. Those, um, those standards are fairly minimal, so they're under what we would currently have in the UK. So I don't necessarily think that's the tool for dealing with some of the concerns about the UK. But I think it, it's important that we still continue to have those in trade deals that the UK does. I think we also need to think about our obligations to women in the countries with whom we trade, as well as women in this country. Um, I think what we need are, um, is independent scrutiny mechanisms, both to examine um, analyze trade agreements for their potential gender impact in advance while early on in the process, not you know at the end when it's been negotiated. And secondly, to monitor what the actual impact is. Because one of the things you find before trade agreements is lots of arguments, and there's arguments between economists and others about what, what impact will this agreement have on people. There's very little that actually goes back and does really comprehensive empirical work saying, OK, what impact has this trade agreement had overall and on different sectors? You get little sector studies sometimes, and you get studies that say GDP in this country went up. There's a missing gap in the middle. Um, and um, I'd be really keen to talk to you about that more afterwards. Mm. 
Yeah, uh, I'm just going to, I think, given time is short, focus on the, the, the trade question. I, I think that there's overwhelming evidence from, um, from history, um, a number of economic studies, principles, and so on, that, that free trade is a good thing and increases the overall welfare of the economy. Um, I think there's about one economist in the world who disagrees with that. Unfortunately, he's an advisor to President Trump. But that, that is one of the things that economists agree is free trade is good for the overall economy. But people also recognise that there are distributional implications from that, um, which can, can be a real problem because a lot of the, the, the costs of opening up your economy, um, they aim, maybe affect a small number of people, but they do so in a very concentrated way, which, first of all, that's a, that's a concern because obviously those people are being hit quite hard. But also, of course, it makes it a bit easier for some of those people who you may not necessarily be sympathetic towards, to organise themselves into lobbies that protect the economy from the benefits of opening up the, to free trade. So I think alongside a policy of free trade, you also need to recognise the distributional implications. Um, free trade increases the size of the economic cake, but you still need to think about the distribution of that. Um, I therefore think that this almost is a, a two-stage process. And one is that we should open up the economy as far as possible, but secondly, we need to bear in mind that we need to have the mechanisms in there, whether that's through the tax and, and benefit policy or you know, some form of making sure that we retrain those people who are in those sectors that are losing jobs and so on. We absolutely need to do that. And if, as it happens, that is, you know, the losers are disproportionately women or any other group, then I fully recognise the need for some sort of gender perspective on that as well. But in doing that, we shouldn't lose sight of the overall benefits that, that free trade will will bring. Um, and my concern is that in you know, focusing on individual losers, we're, we're sometimes missing out that big picture that you know, free trade is a good thing. Uh, we'll all benefit from a net reduction in, in trade barriers if Brexit is done well. Pfizer. Yeah, I mean, I guess following on on the free trade stuff, it's not modern trade, trade deals, they affect all parts of life and not just about goods moving back and forward. And we know that they have things on environmental rules, on public services, on um, you know, various different human rights issues. And so, you know, the first thing we have to do when we talk about trade deals is acknowledge that there's a democratic deficit in this country because the way in which trade decisions are made, it doesn't go through Parliament. Not a lot, not a lot of people know about this. So there's this huge amount of work that's going to be done around whatever the Brexit trade deal will look like. That will be done by a small group of people. It will have huge ramifications for the rest of us. It doesn't have to go through Parliament for them to get that trade deal through. Um, so, you know, look out for the work. I think it's um, War on One, Global Justice Now. Look up at the stuff that they're doing about this, trying to put push pressure that whatever that deal, is, that trade deal, that final free trade deal is and, and the makeup of that deal, because the detail is really important, goes through Parliament and there is a say on that. Um, I mean, I think one of the cons concerns that I have with a lot of, when you look at a lot of free trade deals around the world or trade deals in, in general is that they include all kinds of rules that are actually really bad for people. So, for instance, they can include something called a necessity test that says that standards and regulation must be the least burdensome for business. So, you know, and we don't have something that says has to deliver most for communities or do something about inequality. And often trade deals are balanced towards business interests. So we have to keep an eye on what that trade deal looks like. We have to be really careful. I mean, obviously you work in the department, but I think us as civil service, civil, um, civil society, people interested in the issue, the general public, um, we have to be careful that this isn't a trade deal that again puts business and business interests first before everyone else, because you can't assume, you can't assume that with more growth, um, there'll be less inequality, because we just, ha we just haven't seen that in, in the last few decades. Um, just on um, the human trafficking, I mean, I think there's a lot of things, if this is, and, and it looks that way, I agree. I mean, I didn't expect the government to be so incompetent, to be honest. I didn't expect it to be this far gone and us not to have a firm plan. Um, and now, yeah, I mean, it, it's very possible that we have a disorderly uh, exit. Um, and in that, in that case, then I think a lot of things could fall through the gap and all kinds of issues will come up that we just haven't thought about. Um, whether that be about how certain goods will get in um, or whether that be about human trafficking. Um, it's, it's 
obviously very concerning. Um, and then just we, the terms of like we, solidarity, women working together and m making a point of these issues. Um, you know, I think how we show solidarity, in some ways it's being part of a trade union, it's going out and fighting for these things, it's, it's protesting where we can, it's going to TGI um, right now, this wait, waiting staff is protesting because and, and striking because they don't get tips. How can we together go and join those struggles? So it is we, it does look like a collective we, it's not just placed on the shoulders of a few people. I mean, one of the things that has happened over the last 30 years is that that pulling apart, that, that lack of glue, the lack of solidarity between us, even though these issues affect so many of us and even though we care. So I think we have to be much more active in, in being vocal and in going and standing with other women and other people in difficult situations. Thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry to the others of you who did have your hands up, but we are very much out of time. And um, I'm going to take another couple of minutes of your lunch break to just give the panellists a final chance for final comments. Um, to try and end on a positive note, can I ask you each to reflect on Brexit is going to repatriate a lot of policymaking powers back to the UK Parliament. What could be done to help gender equality in the UK with some of those genuinely new opportunities for the UK Parliament? Well, I have to say, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure... In terms of, of parliamentary powers on legislation, I, I don't accept the premise of that. You know, we have the power to make legislation. We have the power to we have the power to introduce um, uh, equality laws that are far in advance of what we have in the EU. Um, we already had that power. Um, that's not that's not a new power we're going to get. We may have additional powers to make trade deals, but as Pfizer said, those won't be powers that the UK Parliament will have scrutiny over. Those will be smaller parts of government. So, um, but to end on a positive note, I think that um, one of the, the most effective things um, right now that the government could be doing is to actually carry out full impact assessments, um, not just on gender, but on the intersection of a whole series of inequalities on income, on race, on disability, of policy, which was supposed to be brought about by the public sector equality duty, but didn't happen. This does not have to be an onerous and red tape process if it is done properly. It becomes onerous and red tape if you make somebody do it at the end of the process and then they have to tick a load of boxes. If you get people thinking about equality impact from the beginning of the policy making process, then you avoid some of these mistakes at an early stage. And that applies to trade deals, that, but that also applies to our budgets. Um, it applies to um, uh, the next um, spending review. Um, and I think if we're going to do one thing, that's what I would do right now. Okay, I, I, what I think is needed is a, is a fundamental change of, of mindset. Um, at the moment, those people driving the, the process in, in Whitehall and Westminster seem to be regarding Brexit as a ghastly and unwelcome exercise in, in damage limitation. So the emphasis is very much on minimising the additional costs that I think most people recognise will be coming if we have any increase in, in trade barriers and other frictions in our relationship with the EU. In the process of doing that, they're not thinking about the potential opportunities and not focusing on maximising those. And I think it could be a long talk if you want about the benefits of Brexit, but in short, it's um, having a, a more open trading relationship with the rest of the world and regulatory optimization at home. That doesn't mean abandoning standards, that means rethinking them, having standards that, for example, are proportionate and, and, and science-based. If the government starts thinking in those terms, I think we've got a much better chance of getting a, a better Brexit outcome. And then that, in turn, grows the economy rather than shrinks it. And that then, in turn, gives you the additional money, the additional wealth that does allow you to start tackling some of the many other problems we've, we've got. Um, you know, the NHS, for example, I think you know, even people who think that it needs fundamental reform would also accept it's also underfunded. So you know, a stronger economy post-Brexit would provide more money for the NHS, not necessarily 350 million a week, obviously. Um, but you then can do things that at the moment you're constrained from doing because the money simply isn't there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> trying to think of something positive. I mean, um, look, never waste a good crisis is what I would say. We need to, like I say, like maybe Brexit could have been different and, and um, 
but the people in charge of it right now aren't thinking about people first and they're not thinking about inequality. Um, so we need to hold them to account. All of the promises that we were told uh, during uh, the referendum campaign, we need to be making the arguments very clearly right now for the end of austerity. Don't forget what's happened over the last eight years. Don't make it all about Brexit. Austerity has, has hurt this country enormously. We need to be calling for investment. Um, we need to have our own progressive plan of policies that we put forward. Now, even I and I also don't accept the premise that we suddenly will get all the new controls of, of legislation and policy. We've, we've had a lot of that control anyway. Um, but still, we need to be shouting louder than ever that these are the policies that are going to help this country. We don't want a Brexit that just means more of the same or even a worse situation. Um, and so, yeah, I think, that's, I think we just have to be... to make sure that we have some sort of plan so we're not just stuck with their plan. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you all for coming. And can you please just join me in thanking them again.